maker of heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you have discovered that, will you say amen? <laughs> amen, right? Well, my name is Shay Fitzgibbons. I'm the, your Raymond campus pastor. It's an honor to be here with you in Greenland. Uh, Dan Elliott is over preaching in Raymond this morning and John Cogan in Kittery Point. Our prayers for them as well. We're all delivering different psalms, different messages on different psalms, but they all come from a group of psalms known as the Song of Ascents, Songs of Ascent, uh, as that word meaning to go up. It's a, it's a grouping of psalms that uh, start in 120 and go to 134. These, these 15 psalms uh, probably put together after Israel was released from exile in Babylon and headed back to Jerusalem. And so they're grouped in such a way to be sung by God's people as they are ascending up to Jerusalem. And they cover a wide swath of themes. Everything from uh, grief uh, up to God's protection and his deliverance uh, to praise and, and just lifting honor to the Lord their God. And this uh, particular Psalm 124 that we will look at together in just a moment, uh, I love how Drew just so beautifully captured the essence of this Psalm. And it's meant not necessarily for one individual to be proclaiming, but for God's people together to be saying our help is in the name of the Lord. And this is the same Lord who is the maker of heaven and earth. The, the one who made everything, all of creation, is the one who knows us by name, is the one who has saved us and called us to be his people. And so what he desires from us is a response and a response of praise. What we'll look at, though, is this particular Psalm 124. The context of it is a setting of adversity. Anybody here ever experienced adversity? Show of hands. If there isn't a hand that's going up, you're lying. <laughs> if you've taken a test in school, you've experienced it. You're grown up. You've experienced loss of a loved one. You know that feeling of adversity. If you've lost a relationship with somebody you loved, you know how difficult that is. If, if you've been in a position at work and your vocation and you're feeling challenged because you have to take a stand either for Christ or based on your integrity and somebody's pushing back against you, you know what that adversity feels like. For me, uh, I experienced depression for several years. It wasn't that long ago. And a psalm like this is what I needed to hear. That in the end, no matter what my circumstances were at the time, whether they got better or whether they stayed the same or whether they got worse, no matter how I felt, there was a truth and a promise in those words that my help is in the name of the Lord. He's the maker of heaven and earth. Shay, he, he knows you by name. You think depression is too big for him? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I got help from my doctor, I got medication, I got help from a therapist, I got help from the body of Christ praying for me. 
ultimately, I found out that my help in all of that was because of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So if you're in a place right now of adversity, if you're experiencing loss, if you're experiencing grief, depression, if there's a, a challenge or a trial or struggle with sin in your life, I want you to walk away with that message today. The Lord's on our side. He's going to deliver you from evil and he's deserving of your praise. Amen? Hey, why don't we turn there together if you'd find a, a Bible in the rack in front of you or take out your phone or a good old-fashioned Bible you've brought from home. Turn to Psalm 124. Eugene Peterson wrote an awful lot about these psalms. He has a book called uh, An Obedience in the Same Direction. And uh, he talks about the metaphors that we'll see in these psalms. And he said, with all of these psalms, these songs of ascent, uh, they talk about a trip to Jerusalem, acted out a life lived upward toward God, an existence that advanced from one level to another in deepening maturity. So what we'll find is that there's a call in all of these once again to pursue a dwelling with God. As Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14 would say in the New Testament, for here we do not have an enduring city here in this life, but we are looking for the city that is to come. And so it was for the ancients as it is for us in the midst of adversity and trial, we are looking forward to a hope to a day when Christ returns and everything, all of the pain, all of the sadness and sickness and death will be no more. We look forward to that day when our king will return, our help and our dwelling place will be with God and he will be with his people and he will make everything new. The maker of heaven and earth will take all that we've experienced and make it new. And so, as we get prepared to look at this, I want for our commitment in our own hearts and in our minds to be that we would seek this dwelling place with the Lord in the midst of our adversity. There are four out of these songs of ascent that are attributed to King David, and Psalm 124 is one of those. I think uh, like a good country western song, you know, it walks you through a story. I believe that King David was reflecting on an incident in his reign. And he's going he's gonna to bring us through three verses in a sense, three, three movements in these verses to follow. So we'll take them one movement at a time. The first here in the first five verses, David writes... If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. So you see, Without even knowing the context, the first thing you can see with what King David is doing upon reflection is looking back at the severity of this predicament that he's in. It's almost as if what he's trying to do is say, uh, without God's presence, without his intervention, just how severe this predicament was that Israel was in. And you know, it... It is that way for God's people. Uh, this predicament, as I'll have us look at in just a moment, came shortly after King David was anointed as the king, the new king of Israel following King Saul. And it seems to be that God often, at the, the beginning of someone's experience in the Christian faith or in their walk with the Lord having pivoted from 
one chapter to the next, will often put our faith to the test with some sort of trial or a challenge or a test. We often ask, why is God doing this? But God has purpose in everything he does and for the believer, it's all for our good. So God does seem to test those who trust him. He seems to do it for a number of reasons, to develop further trust in him. Also to test the merit of our trust. How deeply do we believe that God is for us and not against us? And then ultimately to demonstrate something of his power in the midst of our weakness, of his almighty intervention in the midst of our absolute dependency upon him. Oftentimes he will allow us to get to the brink of disaster, to, to the edge of ourselves before we cry out and say, God, help and he comes in and saves us. There's this quote that if you search for it on the internet, you will see it's often misattributed to uh, President Abraham Lincoln. It's actually about him, and it's from Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. It's from a lecture that he gave in 1883 to a group of law students about not President Lincoln, but about the lawyer Lincoln. After Lincoln had come to be in law, he had experienced many challenges, many trials, and of course, as the president 16th of our United States, he brought us through the Civil War and experienced great trial in that instance. But this quote from Ingersoll says this, that nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. And so the background to this psalm, most scholars believe, is actually found in 2 Samuel chapter 5. You can look at this later. I encourage you to tune in with Pastor Bruce on Seize the Day. I think he'll perhaps uh, unpack this story a little bit more. But I want you to just listen to this story and try to imagine in your mind's eye uh, the predicament that King David and the people Israel were in. As I said, he was just anointed king over Israel. And it says in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17, that when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king, they went up in full force to search for him. And it says the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. This is a, a valley just outside of Jerusalem. They, they speak of going up to Jerusalem because any of you who have been there know that Jerusalem stands up on a hill. It's, it's fortified, if you will, from the, the valleys around it. And so one of these valleys just outside is where these Philistines are gathered. And so David says here, he inquired of the Lord, shall I go out to attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? And the Lord answered him, go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. I love how David, in the midst of this first challenge, turns to the Lord and asks of him, turns in prayer and says, Lord, what shall I do? His intuition is probably to go and fight, but if it's the wrong decision, he'd be remiss not to pause and pray. How often do we just rush right into something and then in the aftermath turn and say, oh no, Lord, did I do the right thing? If we would just pause before we rush headlong into a battle or a challenge and just pray and see what the Lord has to say. Well, in this instance, the Lord affirms that instinct and says, go, but he says, go, for I will deliver them into your hands. Well, that would be enough of a test, you would think, of David's power now as king. 
And, and indeed, he goes and defeats the Philistines. They, they abandon their idols, the text says, and they run off and the, the, uh, the Israelites collect the idols as uh, treasures of war and bring them back into their stronghold. That would be enough, you would think, of a test, but the Philistines regroup and they come back for a second attack. Now, you can imagine, just fresh off of war, that what you need to do is come down off of that high, off of the, the adrenaline and all of the emotion and, and tend to your wounded and, and just take some rest. But here the enemy comes back around to attack a second time. And this time, again, the Lord, or David inquires of the Lord, shall I go and attack? But the Lord answered and said, do not go straight up against them. Instead, circle around behind them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. This is really cool. He says, as soon, this is the Lord to David, as soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move quickly because that will mean that the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. It seems in the, the first instance that God empowered these Israelites to, to battle hard and to win this fight. And they knew that it was God fighting for them. But in this second instance, it seems something miraculous, perhaps the Lord in the midst of these poplar trees, whether it was the sound of trees swaying in the wind or if there was something supernatural that scared off these Philistines. Whatever the case was, you can't deny that it was supernatural, that God intervened and they routed the Philistines once again. Well, if you're David, after all of this has transpired, you can finally reach a point of reflection. And this is the, the point I believe, of this part of the movement of this psalm is that in the midst of adversity, there has to be a point in reflection where believers look back and simply acknowledge the severity of the predicament. I think that what King David is doing here is being human. I think he's looking at his human emotions and saying, in the midst of all of God's people, you know, if God wasn't on our side, you know exactly what I was feeling and what you were feeling. They would have swallowed us alive. We were goners. We were as good as dead. It was as if the waters would have risen and we would have drowned. So even the king of Israel, as confident as he was, of God's intervention was still human enough like you and me to look back and say, wow, that was intense. That was a real trial. There's no doubt about it. That was difficult. That was adversity. And I tell you what, one of the worst things that we as believers can do is, is minimize things like that. I just did a funeral last night for a 16-year-old who died in a car accident. It, it makes, it, it does no good for anyone to come alongside a family like that and say pat things like, well, I guess God just needed him in heaven or this too shall pass, give it time. Thank goodness I didn't hear anything like that being said to the family members. The best thing that can be said is how awful a tragedy that was. How extremely difficult that must be to be walking through a time like this. And the best thing that God's people can do is come together at a time like that. So in adversity, we have to look back at the severity of the situation. We have to visualize it. But here's the key. David says, if the, word, if the Lord were not on our side, but he's, he's showing us that he's acknowledging already the Lord had intervened. 
The Lord indeed was on their side. And so here's a statement I want for us to consider. If it weren't for the Lord, I blank, or we as his church, you fill in the blank. What would it have looked like? Acknowledge the feeling. Remember the struggle. But also do not forget that the Lord was at your side. He's at our side even now through the challenges, through the trials, and through the struggles. Well, David doesn't leave it there. He, he takes us into this second movement, verses six and seven. David says, praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. So you see, now, having reflected on this situation, David has visualized once again with God's people that severity, but now he's saying, come on, Israel, let's realize that we have been rescued. We did not fall prey to our attackers, to our situation, but we have escaped. We realize the rescue. And in realizing that, there's acknowledgement of mercy and protection that we've been saved from something very dire. Did you realize that David, as the king, did not take credit for their attack? He didn't say, look at what we've done. Look at, look at how we have defended our land. Look how strong we were to stand up and make a fight against our enemies. No, he says, we were rescued. We got away. There was a, a way out from certain doom. It's what David is doing is reflecting back on a traumatic incident. Any of you who have experienced trauma, there is always some sort of post-trauma stress. Uh, some, it, it gets so difficult that it leads to a disorder where it interferes with all of life and you're unable to, to move forward with your daily activities or your vocation or in your relationships. And they call that PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so many of our military and first responders experience this because of the severity of what they have experienced and the rescue, but without perhaps the, the correct intervention to help process what they've been through. So much so that uh, two of our very own here at the Greenland campus, Steve Cooper and Patty Green, said we have to do something about this for our first responders. Uh, Steve Cooper is a uh, retired Army combat vet and uh, a very decorated long career with the New Hampshire State Troopers. He's retired now. And Patty Green had a, a long uh, service in emergency patient services in two different hospitals in New Hampshire. The two of them came together and they said, there are first responders who end up leaving their jobs because they can't take the stress anymore. There are even those who take their own lives because they're haunted by some of the images that they've never healed from. And so along comes this ministry called Reboot Recovery. It's a ministry that we hold right here in Greenland and it's for first responders. So there's a safe and confidential place for them to come together and just share the stress together that they're going through. But not to, to leave it there, to realize that there is a rescue. And so in the workbook for this ministry, what they encourage uh, these participants to do is to reframe that trauma, to, to go back in and enter it, just like King David is doing, and saying, don't let that trauma keep you stuck in this place, but realize that you've been saved, that there, you have moved out of that trauma. You are not where that trauma once was. And so with phrases like this, they encourage 
people to realize the rescue. I've survived. I'm safe. Wounds can heal, and so will mine. God loves me and went through the trauma at my side. And God will use this experience for good in my life. So in adversity, as the leader of God's people, King David is saying, come on, God's people. Come on, church. Let's realize the rescue. Do not stay stuck in that trauma. And so I want to encourage us, again, with a statement to say thanks to the Lord because I or we have what? Experienced what sort of rescue? I want you to fill in that blank as an act of worship in your mind here this morning. David brings us into the last and final movement of this psalm. This is what you heard Drew sing so eloquently. He says, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He has visualized the severity. He's helped them realize the rescue, but now the most important piece is to recognize, give recognition to the rescuer. Did you notice that in this short psalm, just eight verses, the, the name the Lord appears four times. There's an emphasis in this psalm on the rescuer. He is the Lord. The Lord here gets all the credit for our rescue. As David says, he is our help. He is the one in the midst of that severity and that adversity who comes in with the rescue in order that we would give him all of our praise. He wants us to know that nothing is too big for him. And so David says, remember, this is the one who created everything. Again, I've not been to Jerusalem, but for those who have, they tell me that where it is situated up on this hill You have to ascend up to it. But even as you are there on that temple mount, you look out and you're still surrounded by mountains and those valleys in between. And so it would be very easy to imagine, if you will, not having been there, God's people on this pilgrimage heading to Jerusalem, ascending that mountain, remembering that this is God's dwelling place and looking out at those mountains and imagining the kind of attack that would have come from the enemies, but being square in the midst of where God says he is with his people. There, God is their help and he is the one who made those mountains. He's the maker of heaven and earth That has a way in Hebrew poetry of saying everything. Not just the heaven that we might think of when someone dies to go to be with the Lord and the earth is just the the, the ground upon which we, we walk, but everything from the spiritual to the earthly, God has created it all. And so in the face of adversity, David is recognizing this rescuer, the Lord, and where our help is found. I love how Drew put that together. And I encouraged folks in Raymond last week when I preached this message that when something occurs in your life, perhaps it will even be this week, it may even be today, that brings you to this place of anxiety or maybe triggers past trauma and emotions, this would be a a great one-liner to sing in your mind or to sing it out loud. Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Maker of heaven and earth, our help 
is in the name of the Lord. And I'll tell you, one of the things that would happen when you're doing that is not that you're just saying my help, but you're reminding yourself that you are not alone. You are not the only one who has experienced this trial and this struggle. We are not meant to go through this life alone. God has situated it in such a way that his community is to be a place of strength because of our dependence upon him. And so at times of adversity, we come together as God's people and we say our help. We look to our left, we look to our right, we look before us and behind us. And in a picture of strength like this, we are surrounded by one another and we are protected by our Lord, our help, the maker of heaven and earth. And so you walk into a place like Greenland. I, I just had this conversation this morning with Donna. I'm not gonna point her out, but if you meet somebody named Donna, give her a hug. <laughs> you can be like Donna, you can be like Doug. You can walk into this place and it can feel so very large it can actually feel lonely. You can come and worship, and it can be this fabulous one-on-one -on -one experience with the Lord. The music is excellent. The presentation is top-notch. I think the preaching's pretty good. <laughs> I haven't finished yet, so I'll let you determine. But be honest, right? You can walk into a place like Greenland, and it can be a place where you can sit in the shadows and it's possible the only one who might say hello is a greeter on your way in and your way out. There is some onus on each one of us, yes, to not just come in and go out. But folks, there is an onus on all of us. When we see somebody by themselves with a cup of coffee this morning or a sandwich sitting alone or, or maybe they're lingering here in the sanctuary after the service has ended, just sitting by themselves, we are to be a people who love one another and come together. And so our experience, week in, week out, whether we're here in this place or whether we're out in the world, is that we should be for one another. We should be looking out for each other and reminding each other that our help is in the name of the Lord. We depend on him together. It's what I said to the family last night and friends who were grieving the loss of this young man. 6,065 days were the number of his days. Far too short. There's nothing you really can say that's going to take away that pain, nothing that will replace his absence. But only this very fact that even Jesus, when he was at the funeral of someone who died that he loved, even Jesus wept. You remember the story with Lazarus. His sisters pleading that Jesus would make it there for Lazarus who was sick before he died. Of course, Jesus had a purpose in his delay, but he arrived after Lazarus has passed and Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, just beside themselves knowing that if Jesus had arrived, he could have healed him. But lo and behold, He's already in the grave. And so Jesus arrives to this scene where there's wailing, there's mourning, there is palpable grief. That, that's what it felt like last night. And so I said, you could simply be wondering and in this place of deep grief and pain, crying out and saying, God, where are you? Where were you? And it's just like that story. He's right at our side. He is weeping in the midst of our pain.
but he's also our help. And I encourage them by saying, the only place you can truly run and find the help you need is in the name of the Lord. The one who knows you inside and out. The one who knows all of your struggles and pain. The one who came alongside me and said, Shay, I see the depression you're in. I see all the self-doubt. I see the lowness. I see the woe. I see the isolation that you feel. But you are not alone. You are not the only one who has experienced this. Lean into God's people, and he says, lean into me. And I truly did find that my help was in the name of the Lord. There is this story that uh, Eugene Peterson tells in this book I had mentioned earlier, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction is the, the name of this book. I encourage you to pick up a copy when you can. You can find that online. He, um, long time Presbyterian pastor, and uh, you would, might recognize his name as the, the translator of that very dynamic translation of the Bible called The Message. That's Eugene Peterson. Uh, also, not only an author, but a seminary professor. This entire book is about all of the songs of ascent and his uh, reflection upon them. And he says, in the midst of this very psalm, we aren't to, to focus on the problems. Yes, the problems exist. We, won't, we do not want to deny that they're there. But it's not the hazards that we focus on. Instead, it's the fact that God's people in the midst of it are the only people in all the world who can sing. Who can sing in the midst of a trial because we know where our help comes from. He writes, how God wants us to sing like this. Blessed be God, he didn't abandon us defenseless. He writes, Christians are not fussy moralists who cluck their tongues over a world going to hell. Christians are people who praise the God who is on our side. Christians are not pious pretenders in the midst of a decadent culture. Christians are robust witnesses to the God who is our help. Christians are not fatigued outcasts who carry righteousness as a burden in a world where the wicked flourish. Christians are people who sing Oh, blessed be God, he did not abandon us defenseless. It's our witness that people will sing. As we sing in the midst of tragedy and trial and struggle and adversity, it's our witness that people will see. And Bethany Church, I pray that our witness is this very fact that no matter our circumstances, no matter the severity, the Lord is on our side. He will deliver us from all evil. And he is deserving of our praise. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are your people and that is only by your grace. There is nothing we have done to earn being your people but only because of what you have done through Jesus Christ our Savior. It's not even because of our obedience that you're on our side or that you're our help. But Lord, even in our transgresses and sins, you had forgiven us through Christ Jesus. So Lord, use that reality to change us from the inside out, to, to drive us to obedience out of a sense of gratitude so that our song would be one of what Jesus has done for us. That you, God, our Father, are the only God who saves. 
that the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to live in the midst of a world full of trials and tragedy and struggle, in the midst of a world that has turned its back on you, dear God. We are your people who stand out, who can sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. The name of the Lord, that is where our help is found. The maker of heaven and earth. We pray this in Jesus' name.